far-right extremism um, has always been a threat in the United States. And in fact, for um, several of our founders, one of the, um, one of the, the, the moments the defining moments of their disengagement was the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Mm. Um, and, and, and as a country, we tend to forget um, that threat mm. when, when, when there's seeming times of peace. Of course, the victims don't um, uh, yeah. forget that threat. And so um, despite the politics of the day, far-right extremism is still very much a part of um, the threat of domestic violence in the United States. Now, we feel it a little bit more acutely today because of Charlottesville um, in particular, and that was, that was another defining moment in our organizational history. And it was a moment in which the United States sort of took a step back and they thought, oh, wow, I thought, I thought we were past that. Mm -hmm. You know, and to see uh, young white men parading through a college campus, um, shouting sort of anti-Semitic slogans was like, oh, it was a real wake-up call. And, it, and, and, and the good news, if there's a good news for something like that, was it was also a wake-up call for people who are involved or, you know, um, becoming involved in far-right extremism to, to, to stop and think, this isn't the life I want. This is not what I want. This is not what I signed up for. And so what we find, getting back to sort of the initial uh, question is, um, people get involved with these groups for a number of different reasons. Oftentimes, ideology is not the primary factor. And that should offer us some hope because it's a lot easier to approach someone's involvement from the non-ideological side to understand what aspects of that person's life created and primed them for, um, for their involvement. Do they face any resistance when they try to leave the far right organizations? It's a great question. Um, resistance from within their group? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, safety is a big factor for some people. Um, and sometimes the mitigation early on is to find a way to get that person away from their environment, their physical environment, uh, especially with women. Um, violence, retribution, and violence is very real. Um, and it could be, oddly enough, it could be the factor that pushes someone away from the group because they realize that they've been victimized this whole time, uh, but it could also be a factor that pulls them further in and um, a, an obstacle that keeps them from, from asking and seeking for help. You know, I think the allure of mis- and disinformation is the key here. So it's not so much being able to identify what's not factual, it's being able to, it, it, part of it is, is to understand why people gravitate to mis- and disinformation in the first place. Um, it could be empowering to consume things that you think other people are not consuming, things that are outside of the mainstream. And I say that only as a modest rebuttal to the idea that older folks are the ones that are more likely to fall victim to misinformation. If you expand your understanding of why people fall prey to misinformation, you might see that it's, we're all sort of available for that.